Let's switch gears and I'm going to talk about life sin. We're going to describe the use of life sin for estimating life loss. We're going to focus on life loss. Life sim also does direct economic damages um, and also does indirect economic damages using a, a tool called ECAM. What is life sim? So life sim is a tool to estimate life loss from hazard. It estimate consequences from a hazard. That hazard can be a dam breach. It could be a levee breach. It could be a flood. It could be a fire. The hazard is just a time series of that hazard moving through space. And you define the parameters that help define if people lose their life or not. And you can model evacuation from that propagating hazard. So it's agnostic. It doesn't have to be a flood. It's designed for a flood because it's paid for by dam and levy safety. So it's very tooled for flooding, but that doesn't mean you have to use it. It has the ability to track individual people. It's an agent-based model. So a lot of times when, when I hear things like that, I think, oh, God, it sounds too complicated. But it's not, and we'll talk about that. Do you remember the, the by-hand exercise that you all had yesterday where you're going through and doing it by hand? This is just doing that, but doing it all for you on, for every structure and for every person. Traffic simulation engine to estimate the evacuation process. This is a big one in, in uh, consequence modeling. Not a lot of consequence models actually look at the, act, the potential for people to get caught because of flooding, especially because of heavy traffic. This model has the ability to model that traffic, model the densities on roads, and capture people where they could potentially be getting caught. Monte Carlo sampling of uncertain par parameters. So as we saw from that case history, there is a lot of uncertainty to what can happen. You can enter parameters into life sim with uncertainty, and it runs with Monte Carlo to give you a distribution of life loss results. That's really important because it's not just about the mean, it's about what could potentially happen, right? It's about the range. All right, so the big question, can people get to safety before water arrives? That's what we wanna to try to model. That's what LifeSim is trying to simulate when it's doing life loss estimation. What's our initial distribution of people? Where are they at? And will they be able to get out of harm's way? How many will be able to get out of harm's way? For those remaining, where are they gonna be at? You saw this earlier this week, several times, this evacuation timeline, but that I'm glad, I, I, I want this this clear and, and, and consistent message of this evacuation timeline because this is a really good way to think about it. Think about the processes that lead to somebody taking protective action and trying to get to safety. Also keep in mind that why are we all doing this, right? Why are, why are we even in this class today? It's because what's our objective? We don't want people to die. I don't want people to die. We're all, you know, professionals who are working to try to make the world a safer place. And that's cheesy, but um, our objective is minimizing life loss. So to better understand what can create life loss, you can then take actions and alternatives to minimize it. All right, so we model, the, we model each of these components in LifeSim explicitly. Uh, so warning delay time is modeled with three parameters. Imminent hazard, um, that imminent hazard identification time. Talked about this with Teton. When was it identified, oh no, this dam's gonna breach, I need to communicate with the emergency managers and let them know they need to evacuate people downstream. That's the imminent hazard identification time, the point that, the, that somebody realizes it's too late and people need to evacuate. And then they need to communicate it with the emergency management agency that's, that's available. Now, in Oroville, they were all in the same room. So that communication delay, that time it took to communicate with emergency managers was zero. But if you're at a, at a dam way out in the mountains and that dam breached and you don't have access to phone, it could take hours before you can get in your vehicle and drive to a point where you can communicate. So that communication delay is a factor that can, can be important. And then finally, warning issuance. That, that once the emergency manager receives that information, they need to evacuate, there's that time delay before they actually issue an evacuation order. Um, that time delay can be very short, it can be very long. All right, so once the, once the warning is issued by the emergency management agency, how, does it, how quickly does it spread throughout the population? We represent this function in LISIM as a tabular function with uncertainty. And so it's the percentage of population that gets warned over time. And I'll talk about how that gets down to the agent-based level here in a minute. But it's a curve function that represents your, your population and what percentage of them get warned over time. 
Once they receive that warning, how long does it take them to take protective action? And that's represented by this PAI curve, protective action initiation curve. Same, same concept. What I want to point out with the PAI curve, however, is that it doesn't necessarily um, finish out at 100%, meaning that, and it rarely does, in fact. Meaning rarely will you ever see a situation where 100% of your population at risk successfully evacuated, or even evacuated at all. There's often times where people choose not to evacuate. They feel, oh, I'm safer in my home, I've lived here my whole life, blah, blah, blah. But there's also people who simply can't evacuate, right? They don't have the means. They don't have the, they're, they have disabilities where they're unable to. They would have to get assistance and they can't get it in time. So those two curve functions, the warning dissemination and the protective action initiation, how does it work in life sim? I'm gonna take this structure that has two people in it, for example. Remember that you have your structure inventory. Each structure inventory has a population associated with it. I'm gonna take this as an example. Um, step one, because that warned over time function represents our whole population, right? It's our community level. We're saying our community is gonna receive a warning roughly this speed. Um, we can sample for this structure saying, you know what, They're, they represent a portion of this community. So by sampling randomly off of this fraction of population that receives warning over time, we can then, by doing this for all structures, we rebuild this function so that our community is being warned over time at the rate that we're saying it should be. So this, this structure with two people in it, in this particular iteration, will uh, receive a warning 78 minutes after warning issuance. Okay, then we sample the mobilization curve and identify when they would mobilize once they receive that warning. So what the scenario that LifeSim is going to simulate for this one structure is two people will, will leave their structure 178 minutes after the warning gets issued, okay? So if the warning is issued, you know, four hours in advance, they have a really good chance of getting out. However, if the warning, if the warning is issued relatively close to the dam failure or the, the flood, the hazard, then uh, they may not get out in time. Or they may get caught on the road if they, who knows? I mean, that's up to the simulation. So LifeSim is doing this for every structure, in, for all our population groups, every iteration. And every iteration is a slightly different, potentially a slightly different warning function and mobilization function. Because remember, those functions were defined, I'm gonna go back, with uncertainty. So every iteration is gonna be a slightly different function based off of these uncertainty bands. Pretty interesting stuff. Here's a visual of what that looks like. Um, so uh, as I click next, it's gonna start animating. Um, as you remember that it samples off that warning curve to figure out when people receive a warning. When they receive a warning in the simulation, the house is turned from brown to yellow. And then once the people in that structure decide they're gonna take protective action, try to evacuate, they turn into a blue car and try to evacuate out. This animation is directly out of LifeSim and this is what's happening. now. This is one iteration, right? So in the next iteration, the warning dissemination may play out slightly differently. So different structures receive warnings at different times. That structure that we that I just has an example that received a warning and evacuated 178 minutes after, on the next iteration, they may evacuate like five minutes after the warning is issued or not at all, depending on how the functions are defined. All right, so they've taken protective action. They decided to leave their home. Um, how long is it gonna take them to reach safety? This is, a, this is a big part of, uh, of life loss assessment that's often ignored is that time is gonna take from when they, people take protective action to reaching safety and the risk that they're taking in between then. As we know, cars are very unstable in floodwaters. And so that's a very high risk situation. They're imposing risks by taking that, that step. And uh, we need to model that explicitly, LifeSim does. Uh, so it models evacuation two ways, horizontal, which is, uses a road network and destinations to simulate uh, traffic, or vertical, if people are stuck in their house because they weren't able to evacuate in time, or if they, uh, if they choose not to evacuate, then it's assumed they're gonna evacuate vertically within their structure. And the type of structure matters, occupancy type matters. All right, for the horizontal evacuation, how people are evacuating when they're on the road. I know Jason has a similar slide earlier. Um, on the traffic simulation engine that's used, all this fanciness over here is simply just saying the more people there are on the road with you, the slower you're gonna go. The dense, it's a speed density relationship. 
So we've all been on the freeway before, we're driving along, everyone's happy as a clam, and then eventually there's enough vehicles that are going onto the on-ramp ahead of you that you start slowing down and then traffic jam, stop and go, right? Uh, that's what's simulated with this function over here and that's what's simulated in the software. How do people know where they're going? That's the, that's the big question. So you define destinations as points outside of the floodplain, generally. Um, and people will, when you, that ev evacuating group decides, you know, I'm going to leave, I'm going to evacuate, they're going to pick the, the destination they can get to the fastest as their first shot. Okay? So they're going to get on the road, not the one that's closest, this is really important, the one they can get to the quickest based off of the road characteristics. So they may jump on a freeway if they can because you can drive much faster. Um, it allows for one-way roads. So one-way roads are important because if you're, if, you get, if you're driving down a one-way road and at the end of that road there's flooding, it's going to be a lot harder to turn around. You'll likely get stuck. Uh, evacuation in vehicles or on foot. Uh, vehicles may turn around if the road is flooded. So these agents, remember it's an agent-based model, these agents, cars, when they drive to a road that's flooded, they'll either try to cross that road based on the depth or they'll try to turn around and find a different route. If that individual agent tries to find a different route, then they will remember that that road is flooded and they will never try to go past it again. However, all the other agents that don't know yet, they're gonna go and make the same mistakes. Um, vehicles can reroute if a traffic jam is reached. So this is big in a lot of times, I think we've all been on the freeway multiple times and we, you're in a traffic jam and you pull out your phone, you pull out Google Maps or whatever, and you say, oh, okay, it's bright red for another two miles. You, you happen to be in the right lane, so you take the next off ramp and you go around, you reroute, right? People do that, Waze does that for you. It reroutes you based off what it believes will be the optimal path based on traffic density. This is what happens in life sim. So you, gotta, you set a certain number, percentage of the population that's willing to reroute when they reach a traffic jam and when they do reach a traffic jam, they'll then look at the system in its current density of, of vehicles and find a new route. So it's simulating people's propensity to, to may, take actions to get out quicker instead of just sitting in traffic forever. All right, um, this, I'm not going to test you all on this or anything like that. Uh, this is kind of a step-by-step -step process of what's happening for each agent as they enter a new road. Uh, but I, what I really want to focus on is, does the vehicle enter? So is the next road wet? Yes, it is. Do I enter that road? This is a fairly new feature in Lysim, and I think it's really cool. Employee, used to be an ex-employee of the Army Corps of Engineers, Paul Risher. He now works for HDR. He did a, a deep dive when he worked with us into, um, into this, because we were thinking in Lysim version 1.0, we, we had my, okay, every vehicle, as soon as, it reach, as soon as the road reaches two feet of flooding, they turn around and go back. They're like, nope, I gotta find a reroute. But that's not what happens, right? People come to flooded waters and, and they're like, mm, I can drive through that. A lot of times that happens. And so he did a deep dive and tried to find existing research out there and he found some. There's actually existing research that defines people's propensity to enter a flooded road based off of the depth of water, their, their perceived depth of water on that road. That's great, that works perfectly for us. So we use that directly in LifeSim as a distribution. So we define a distribution of people's propensity to enter a flooded road, and then each agent samples off that distribution for their threshold of what they're willing to risk. What that means is that people are gonna come up to a flooded road and potentially drive into it and lose stability and get in a high hazard situation, which is what happens in reality. So we have, LifeSim has the ability to model bad decisions. It's great, right? So how it works, like I said, each vehicle samples a, a threshold, in this case, 26 um, centimeters, or 0.26 uh, was the sample, 63 centimeters would be the thre threshold. So whenever this vehicle then finds a, a road that has more than 63 centimeters of depth, it's gonna try to turn around. Less, it's gonna try to go through. Separately, separately the stability criteria is assigned to this vehicle, which they may they may be like, I can do this, and their vehicle's like, no, you can't, you're stuck, buddy. And so that's modeled explicitly in the software. Horizontal or vertical evacuations, moving from horizontal to vertical. For people that are trapped in their structures, what do they do? Uh, this is another flow chart, but this does the same thing here, the vertical evacuation process. So first, we assume that people are gonna be able to get to their topmost livable floor, just right out of the gate. Uh, and then, 
do, are they going to be able to get above that? It's, amaz- it's surprising to be not amazing. It's surprising, I guess, how many people don't even know how to get into their attic, right? Or d- wouldn't know how to get into their attic if the situation arose. And so we have to model that. We have to take into that, that into account. Um, further, there's people with limited mobility who simply would not be able to get up there. So we want to be able to account for that as well. So step one, top livable floor. Step two, can they get into their attic or not? If they can, if they can't, they're trapped on their top livable floor, and they'll be uh, uh, they'll be they're, they'll be subjected to the submergence of the water. Um, that'll de- determine their hazard zone. And then, if they can, then they're either going to go to their roof or their attic. And obviously, where you're at in your structure matters when you're looking at depths, right? If you're on your top livable floor, and the depth is above the ceiling, you're in big trouble. But if you're on the top of your house, you're not necessarily in big trouble. This is all assuming that the structure is not collapsing, right? So if the stability of the structure is lost, you're automatically put in that, that high risk situation. That's the whole warning and evacuation process in life sim from start to finish. How it takes the structure inventory, creates individual agents, simulates the warning and evacuation situation, simulates traffic, people going out on the roads, getting caught in traffic jams, trying to reroute, Flood waves propagating through, capturing people in their structures. It's capturing vehicles on the road. It's looking at the depths and velocities at those locations um, to determine the, the hazard, hazard potential for those people. What's important is that it's doing this really, really fast. Um, Murari is uh, with the Department of Water Resources, and he's, he's running LifeSim on, on like 700 plus dams. That's the plan. No, no traffic simulation, but it, you can run a thousand iterations of Monte Carlo iterations, and it takes minutes, I assume. Yeah. So it's it's very efficient. It was designed to be efficient. It was designed to do a lot of processing really quickly, so that we can spend more time analyzing the results. All right, I haven't talked about hazard zones. That's the next step, right? So we've eva- we've simulated that warning evacuation process. We've simulated when people reach safety. Simulated when people got caught. But how do we determine lethality? We determine that by, by first categorizing those that are caught into a lethality zone, either low hazard, where the, the relatively calm flood waters and you just you can generally wait out. Uh, we saw that earlier with the fatality rates. And then high hazard, where you're in a structure that's collapsed, you're in a vehicle that's lost its stability, you're on foot and you've lost stability. You, the, the water depths have gotten above um, your submergence criteria, so you're, you're submerged, fully submerged in the water. These are high hazard situations where you're, in, you're probably losing your life is relatively high. So that's how we discretize these populations that get caught. It's based off of the depths and velocities at their location and the, the type of structure that they're in, if they're in a structure. I'm considering a vehicle structure. That. So, Looking at submergence, we, we talked about that vertical evacuation, how they evacuate vertically. How does submergence work? We assume if they're able-bodied, if somebody is able-bodied, then they're going to be able to get up on, on objects to get their head above water. And so we assume that it's based on depth of uh, water below the ceiling, not from the ground up, assuming people are going to get their head up. So if the water, uh, by default, we put about one foot below the ceiling, if people can get their head above that, then they'll be okay. Um, if the if the flood water goes above that, then they're in a high hazard situation, meaning that there's a good chance that they won't be able to get their head above water. All right. And then further, if they're in their attic, same thing from the roof, uh, from the top of the attic down is the submerged criteria. And then if they're on the roof, the assumption is that it's from the floor up. Now, if they're at limited mobility, the submerged criteria is based on the floor up. Limited mobili- mobility, meaning the assumption that people can get up on objects and get their head up high, is probably not going to happen. And so the submerged is based on how deep the water gets from below, meaning they can't get up on objects. Limited mobility is a, is a, is a value that you can enter in life sim. So you enter, for my population that's below the age of 65, what percentage of that population has limited mobility? And then LifeSim randomly associates people with limited mobility based on that. Whereas 
over 65 maybe have a higher percentage of their limited mobility. So that's, you can enter those directly in the, in the software. We talked about stability quite a bit yesterday with humans. Stability criteria, we talked about that's hazard zone, how, people, how we determine hazard for submergence. Uh, stability in structures. And stability of vehicles. So I, I won't belabor those anymore. We also talked about fatality rates yesterday. These are the fatality rates that are used in Lysim explicitly. But what I will spend a little bit of time on with this is how Lysim uses these fatality rates. Um, so every single dot on this function represents a group that was identified as being in a, in a high or low hazard situation and the percentage of that group that lost their life. So you look at that high hazard function, the blue one, and over 50 or almost 50% of the groups that we identified as being in a high hazard situation, 100% of the people in those groups lost their life. And then it, it starts dropping down from there. Sometimes people are stuck in situations where they're in a high hazard situation and no one loses their life. I think Tom Soccer is, is a case history that's gonna be talked about tomorrow. That's gonna be one of them. Daryl Grigg and Dave Benson from Teton, the two fishermen, they're up here, they're in the 50% fatality rate because Daryl Grigg survived miraculously. Uh, so how does LifeSim use this? When a group is caught, so say, say a vehicle's driving along, they come to a flooded road and they go, I can do this, and they drive through and then they get caught, they lose their stability, and they're put in a high hazard situation. That group, that vehicle, the people in that vehicle are then assumed to be one of the dots on this function, this high hazard function. So it samples, so it basically samples a random number between zero and one and gives that group a fatality rate. The fatality rate, let's say is 50%. Then every single person in that group is another, for every single person, that coin is tossed again to see if, they're, if they lose their life or not. They have a 50-50 chance. So even though you've, you've sampled, a, a, they've simulated a group being in a high hazard situation, they all may survive. And even if they, they're sampled a fatality rate of 50%, they still all may survive. That's really important to show that uncertainty that we all know is out there. However, on the whole, we're capturing what we've identified through looking at historic case studies. Uh, direct economic damages are also simulated in LifeSim uh, using depth damage functions. Depth damage functions can have, can have uncertainty about them. You can have uncertainty about the foundation heights, uncertainty about the values and so on. You can do agricultural damages in LifeSim. So if you have a hydraulic data that has the time that any um, agricultural land first gets wet and the duration of that, you can simulate uh, damages to agricultural lands. So where has LifeSim been used? LifeSim has been used around the world now. Uh, it, here's an example, Whittier Narrows Dam in Los Angeles. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. It's a dam, it's a flood control dam, core dam, directly upstream of over a million population at risk. Over a million people that could potentially be flooded by this dam. So it's, it's pretty big. Why was LifeSim selected as the, as the tool? Well, one, with that much population at risk, LifeSim is one of the few tools that can handle that big of a data set. Two, traffic simulation. This is Los Angeles. Traffic is a huge potential issue. So we need a model that can simulate that traffic so that we can get a sense of how many people could get caught on the roads. This one, Mosul Dam in Iraq. I think uh, hopefully a lot of you are familiar with that. Major potential, potentially the most catastrophic dam failure that could occur. Um, Jason knows a lot about this. Uh, it's What's the population at risk there? It's like millions, right? It's in the millions. There's a huge population at risk here. Limited warning potential. LifeSim was used because at the time, maybe still, I don't know, it was the only model that could handle that much data. Here's an here's a application I like to show that was shared with me from a group out of Australia. They were doing a dam breach analysis and uh, and I, I was, they asked me to look at the model and I looked at it and I thought that this little piece was strange. So if you look at the plot, on your left, the, uh, the plot shows that as, as the warning issuance gets, gets closer and closer, as you have less and less warning time, the life loss is decreasing. Isn't that counterintuitive? You would assume that as you have more, less and less warning time, life loss would increase, right? Fewer people are gonna be able to get out. So it's counter, these results are counterintuitive. 
And so why is that? Well, looking at this animation a little bit, you see that there's this huge shopping center, the Kapalaba Central Shopping Center. And you see tons of people evacuating out of that shopping center and heading north and then cutting either left or right. And eventually, as this floods progressing through, it's not showing this animation, but that road gets cut off at some point, and all those vehicles are start pouring out onto that road and they're getting caught. Okay? So as your warning issuance becomes less and less, more and more of those people are trapped in the shopping center, which is a multi-story concrete steel reinforced structure where people are safe. And so this is a situation where if the warning goes out too early, you're putting these people in particular more at risk. That's really interesting. So some of the outcomes of this could be communicating with that shopping center being like, okay, if, if, if you need to go over the loudspeaker to have people evacuate out and there's flooding, have them evacuate out the north end, right? Where there isn't gonna be as much flooding or notify people to stay and not evacuate. Maybe give them some free lunch or something because it's way safer in that shopping center than being out on the road. Another application of LifeSim in Oroville, uh, create a LifeSim model to the cali calibrated to the Oroville event. Remember, Jason just mentioned that we went out and did this big survey after the Oroville event. It'd be really cool to be able to apply LifeSim and see how well it stacks up to what our um, recorded data is. So looking at that timeline, uh, we can we specifically have times for when the hazard was notified the hazard notification time 3 30 p.m the decision to evacuate and then the first evacuation warning sent right so that's that warning delay portion some of the evacuation orders that went out I, I won't go through these they're just different evacuation orders that went out to different communities so we could use that to inform the the protective action initiation warning diffusion time Here's the, uh, we use the, the results of the, um, of the survey to inform our warning diffusion curves because we wanted to use something that closely represents, closely represented what, what actually happened as possible. So we have warning diffusion and protective action initiation functions for Ute County and Yuba and Sutter County based off of this survey data. It's really great stuff. So how do we do? We, we have all this data. We are able to simulate. We don't have to worry about calibrating to life loss in this case because there was no hydraulic event so we're just simulating the warning and evacuation process and we had all those data pieces so we used them and what do we see we see that observed from the survey is that people generally reach safety about three hours after they left their structure uh, but at range people reported not reaching their final destination until like for until about seven minutes to 50 hours somebody put 50 hours now, that means maybe they were driving to Seattle or something. Um, so you gotta, you gotta take that with a grain of salt, but, but the average was three hours, the median was two hours. That should tell you enough that those little, those little uh, pieces out on the tails of that are um, probably not the, the average, probably don't, don't represent the majority. So how so about the simulation? Simulation, our mean simulated time for people to reach safety was 2.6 hours. So pretty close, pretty, we're simulating traffic pretty close in terms of the amount of time it takes people to get out. It ranged from five minutes to nine hours. I, I was pretty impressed with that, that. We were actually, did pretty well on the range other than the 50 hours, which could be driving anywhere. I did not set a destination. We did not set the model up for people to evacuate to Seattle. If we did, maybe we would have had closer range there uh, with a median of 2.4 hours. So across the board, we did really well at matching the observed data. But did we get it right in the right places? Did we match the observed data? Do we, do we simulate traffic occurring where traffic actually occurred? So looking at that in a little more detail, Oroville up on the northern, northern section of Oroville, uh, you can see the simulation results, all those blue cars bumper to bumper the whole time. Helicopter footage during the event, you see bumper to bumper traffic all the way up through Chico. So we matched traffic really well there. Down here, we matched it pretty well. You can see a little bit of a gap, but that may just be due to the timing of when that, this animation was paused for the screen grab. So we matched traffic very well out of the south as well. So overall, this made us feel a lot better about the traffic simulation engine in the model and the fact that if we have good data, we can simulate what would actually happen. 
you can use that calibrated model to then inform alternatives. So some of the alternative analysis that's being done can then be, uh, can be implemented in LifeSim to see, does it really make an, a, an impact? So by, sim by evacuating people by zone for out of Orvo, will it actually make a big difference in the amount of time it takes people to evacuate? Considering the, the very few number of egress routes out of the area, it may not. So that's something that you could look at directly in the, in the software. That was my, uh, my overview of LifeSim.